Thank you so much. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you all for coming. I want to thank Russ for that opening prayer and um, to Deb for reaching out to me to join you all for tonight's Talk Up Tuesday. I have to admit, it's very rare that I am asked to speak to a devotional audience for a lot of reasons. Um, so I'm actually quite honored to be with you this evening. And you know, I rewrote this talk several times. Uh, the latest rewrite have wrapped up just a few hours ago, and I don't usually do this. But I felt compelled to in this case, because while my talk is about history and what history can, can and cannot tell us about women's leadership in early Christian circles, it's also about ethics. Ultimately, the question of women's leadership is a question about the choices that we make. That's our responsibility, either as historians like me or as Christian leaders. So I want to talk about the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves and our relationships to the past. And additionally, um, because we're here to have a little bit of fun, I want to tell you some of the stories about my favorite women in early Christianity. So hopefully introducing you to maybe somebody um, you haven't heard or introducing details about people you may have heard of, like St. Perpetua. To spoil my own presentation, history never gives us truth. It can only give us evidence. And in the case of earliest Christianity, our evidence is fragmentary. And sometimes it's contradictory. So if we're looking for any one truth, we're going to have to find it somewhere other than the past. And that could be combining historical evidence with textual interpretation or tradition or your own ethics, for example. But despite the fact that there is no convenient truth for us to go ex excavate from the past, so many people still appeal to the past as a source of unquestioned authority. And so what I want to do is explore with you both the advantages and the limitations of treating the past like gospel. So when I teach Introduction to the New Testament, I will inevitably have several women students who self-identify as Christian who ask me a very simple question. Were women leaders in the earliest Christian churches? Now, on the surface, I can answer this fairly easily. Yeah, we have lots of evidence. Um, we have lots of evidence that women did take on leadership positions. You all likely know a lot of this early, early evidence, but in case you don't, this is just a list of the kinds of evidence we have, the mentions of women. Um, and you'll see that women not only held leadership roles in early Christian communities, but that some men like church fathers and heresiologists were really, really mad about it. And we'll talk about that too. I'm not gonna go through all of this evidence in detail, but you know, on this slide, you can see some of the women who are important to Jesus's ministry and on this slide, these are some of the women who are mentioned in um, Paul's letter. Here we're talking about Romans. There are other women. Just to let you know, um, I'm going to send this PowerPoint to Deb. So if anybody wants the citations, you can have them. And of course, you can email me too. Alongside the evidence from scripture that I just very quickly sort of went through, we have lots of evidence from these other sources. And I'm going to talk about some of the really interesting pieces of evidence in the back half of this talk. But for now, what I want you to note is that the evidence we have of women being involved starts at the inception of Christianity. And this is a fairly large array of sources, right? So we're not talking about a little tiny fragment of the entirety of the Christian tradition. We're talking about women were leaders in Christianity. So in one way, it's a really easy question to answer. But I want to say something about leadership before we move on. We know that the very first Christian congregations met in private households. These congregations had to take time to establish religious offices and such. So sure, when, Phoebe, when Paul calls Phoebe a deacon in Romans 16, he might not mean deacon in the same way we mean it now, 
but this wasn't a title that Paul would have just given to anybody. If you read the text carefully, you'll notice that Phoebe was entrusted to carry Paul's letter to the church at Rome. And this was a rather delicate mission because unlike the other letters that Paul sent to other churches, he himself did not establish the church at Rome. And so what he's doing then is sending Phoebe. She's responsible for making Paul's introduction to one of the most powerful churches in early Christian history um, in the first sort of hundred years. One might call Phoebe an ambassador from the church at Cancray to the one at Rome. But here's where the question of definition comes in. And here's where people can make choices about which, or which pieces of evidence they want to prioritize. So when we're talking about Phoebe's leadership as a deaconess, do we choose to claim that the office of deacon wasn't fully established yet, and so Phoebe wasn't really a deacon? Or do we choose to say, no, Paul called her a deacon, she's a deacon? What does leadership entail anyway, especially in a fledgling group that's trying to get back on its feet after its founder is so brutally executed by the empire? Now, needless to say, when I throw these questions back at my students, um, they get a little bit testy with me. And I, I totally understand why. Because what we want are easy answers. We want to look at all this evidence, and there's a lot, and say, you know, here's the truth. It's simple, case closed. We fix this. Let's go fix global warming now. But to me, and you can disagree with me in the Q&A, to me, history never yields truth, at least not this easily. It only gives us evidence. And evidence, even when we have a preponderance of it, like we do in the case of women leaders in the early church, even then evidence is a mess. So analyzing the evidence is also a matter of choice and strategy. Let me show you what I mean. Here is a case study that really makes my students very angry at me. Um, this is an excerpt from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. I'm going to read it to you for reasons that you're going to catch here in a second. So, in, my apologies, my pages are sticking together. In this section, Paul is talking about members of the congregation who had the gift of prophecy. He wanted the Corinthians to worship in an orderly way because the church at Corinth was not orderly by any stretch of the imagination. And so he writes to them for you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and be, all be encouraged. And the spirits of prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is a God not of disorder, but of peace. Okay, right. So if he wants orderly worship services, then this makes sense that he would write this. But then the text goes on to say, as in all the churches of the saints, women should be silent in the churches. For they're not permitted to speak should be subordinate, as the law also says. If there's anything they desire to know, let them ask their husbands at home, for it's shameful for a woman to speak in church. Or did the word of God originate with you? Or are you the only ones it's reached? And so after having said all of that, Paul returns then to the question of prophecy. Anyone who claims to be a prophet, to have spiritual powers, must acknowledge that what I'm writing to you is a command of the Lord, he says. Anyone who doesn't recognize it shouldn't be recognized. The majority of New Testament scholars will tell you that 1 Corinthians 14, 34 through 46, the part about women not being permitted to speak in church, does not come from Paul. It was introduced into the text of 1 Corinthians after Paul and likely to bring this letter into conformity with um, particularly in particular to Timothy. So the household epistles, right? Letters that historians don't think Paul wrote. In other words, this italicized section is not original to Paul. And that makes perfect sense if you read it. If we skip these verses and read it through, the text actually coheres better. The whole section is about prophesying during worship, not about when women can speak. So 
the italicized text also it's not found in our earliest and best manuscripts in the manuscript record it's in different places um, in first corinthians that's usually a pretty good sign that this is a later addition to the text it also doesn't seem to reflect paul's um apocalyptic theology or you know how he thinks about marriage so despite all of this evidence though that 1 Corinthians 14, 34 through 36 is not written by Paul. How many times have we all heard this text being invoked to preclude women from leadership positions, right? People do it all the time. And it's not that people don't know. It's in double brackets in your Bible. It's there. So I'm sure you see where I'm going here. What do we do with something like 1 Corinthians 14, which presents us with a problem both historically and theologically, I'd argue. On the one hand, we might prove this text was not written by Paul through empirical evidence. Historians have done this. And yet, on the other hand, these verses were incorporated into the text of 1 Corinthians early enough that they became tradition for some people, early enough that they became gospel for some people. So it doesn't surprise me that some modern Christian groups use these verses to justify precluding women from leadership roles. The argument I'm advancing, though, is that exclusionary interpretation is a choice. It's a choice to prioritize the Paul who supposedly tells women to be quiet in church over the Paul who sent the deaconess Phoebe to make his introductions at Rome. Both pieces of evidence are canonical if that's what you want to take as authoritative. And our ethics, such as they are, demand that we ask ourselves why we choose one piece of evidence over another. What is at stake for us when we read the past in particular ways? And so make no mistake, even though history never gives us truth, there are plenty of people who claim that their truth, with a capital T, is firmly rooted in history and nothing else. Let me give you one example. So in 1988, a group of evangelical leaders met in Danvers, Massachusetts to draft a statement addressing what they thought were some troubling contemporary developments in, in American culture. Among these are the uncertainty about gender roles, ambivalence, about labor, like homemaking, and increasing feminist egalitarianism. From my perspective, the most telling of these cultural problems that they bring up is the, quote, increasing prevalence and acceptance of hermeneutical oddities devised to reinterpret apparently plain meanings of the Bible. So, Basically, they're saying that people are deviating from an original read of the text. And to address what they thought was a cultural abandoning of this original read, this group affirmed the following things. And I know there's a lot of text on this slide. We're not going to go through all of it. But again, do email me for the slides. So they affirmed a, a couple of things here alongside a lot of other things, and you can see the, um, the URL at the bottom for the full statement. They affirmed that different but complementary gender roles were assigned by God at the time of creation and that the fall introduced distortions in these roles. In a church setting, sin is what makes men seek out worldly power instead of God, and sin is what makes women resist limitations to their roles. So if you want to be redeemed, then you need to return to what the drafters of this statement call a biblical view of manhood and womanhood, which is the sort of complementary gender roles that God established at creation. So this is what the SBC folks are on about right now when they're talking about complementarianism. And I thought I wasn't going to take hits at the SBC, but I guess I did. Sorry. Um, so I know talking about gender complementarianism might bring up some strong feelings, um, but my aim here is to draw attention to the way that this argument works, because we're going to see it over and over again. It appeals to some self-evident 
biblical view that's been around as long as Christianity. Notice all of these scriptural citations. Those are original to the Danvers Statement, and they serve to legitimate this particular theology. But as I showed you earlier, even scripture isn't so straightforward, and we can cite just as much scripture to, to take a different view. So what the Danvers Statement really does is it reduces all the messiness of the biblical text and its interpretation and the messiness of the lives of the earliest Christians and suggests that the Bible is, is self-evident and its meaning is self-evident. Um, and that if you read the text in a different way from how they read it, you are essentially participating in heresy. Now, any historian of early Christianity will tell you that the quickest way to discredit another group of Christians is to call them heretics. It just shuts down the entire conversation. And so you can see the rhetorical strategy that's being used here, right? We're appealing to this pure past. And because we're appealing to this pure past, you, if you disagree with us, you have no ground to stand on because your view is not biblical. So this idea that the biblical text of, of one way of reading the text in a single Christian history, it can be used for all sorts of ends that are fairly nasty. And that's not gonna be new to anybody today. But from a historian's perspective, the ends the text is used for are a product of choice. And I think historians forget that a lot. We like to think that our work is neutral. It's not. Um, and I want to keep saying that. I'll keep hammering it. Because here's the point. The point is we don't have to choose this. We can choose other things too. So I want to spend the second half of the talk considering other possibilities for women's leadership that come to us from the Christian past. And they represent other choices that one might have made or could still make. But before I get into that, let me make something excruciatingly clear. I am not advocating a theological free-for-all. I don't know enough theolo theology to do that. I'm not suggesting that the past should have no bearing on how we live our lives in the present. I'm a historian, so that would be blasphemy for us. But what I am suggesting, what I'm seeing is that there's no objective truth that's just hanging out in the past, just waiting for us to pick it up. Whatever truth we create for ourselves always involves more than some, you know, unequivocal appeal to this biblical view that stopped in time and has stayed frozen for 2000 years. That's not the way people work. So ethics or theology, if you prefer, comes from lots of sources, like your congregation, spiritual leaders, your family. And since you guys are mostly, mostly Catholics, tradition, right? So what I'm advocating here is that we be honest historians, we be honest ethicists, theologians, and acknowledge that our views have changed over time and that we have incorporated influences outside of some sort of standard biblical view. Acknowledging that theologies change might open up new possibilities for how Christians choose to live in the modern world. Likewise, understanding that there's no one Christian past to draw from might also open up new ways of understanding earliest Christians for historians. So this to me is an ethical exercise and also a historical exercise. So if I had to sum up the first part of this talk, I would say, no, the truth is not out there. Um, you know, if I, if I were thinking theologically or if I got theological, I would say that maybe it's in us. I'm still working on that. But what not having a truth out there means is that we have choices to make about what evidence we're going to use to come up with our own history, with our own authoritative way of thinking about the past. So now we're gonna get into some of the fun stuff. At least I hope you'll find it as fun as I do. I wanna talk about the variety of ways women emerged as leaders within early Christian circles. 
mostly I wanted to close with this cheerful material. And also I just wanted to share some of my favorite stories of early Christian women. So this will be a bit of rundown of ancient evidence, but I really hope you'll like it. We've already talked about women in the earliest circles, um, meaning Jesus and Paul. But what about women after the era of Christian origins, when the church started settling in for the long haul, and when it started developing things like church orders? Now, conventional wisdom might tell us that women were sent back to the household. And there is some truth to that conventional wisdom. A good, respectable Roman woman wasn't supposed to be out and about all the time. And yet, Sometimes Christian texts take Roman gender roles and invert them. We see this in um, a lot of martyrdom texts. And so this is my first case study here. And I do want to preface this with a very quick content warning. These texts can be pretty violent. I've minimized the graphic descriptions, but if you need to step away, um, come back in about six minutes because we will have moved on to the next case study. So. One of the most well-known martyrdom texts is the martyrdom of Perpetua and Felicity, which many of you have heard of. Um, many of you have heard of. This was written in the very early 200s, and the text incorporates a first-person account of the trial and then subsequent martyrdom of a Christian woman named Perpetua, who's arrested and then thrown into the arena to face down wild beasts. Now, this is her punishment for not recanting her Christianity. We could spend a whole course on this one text. I know people who do, but what I wanna focus on is Perpetua's masculinity. That's right, Perpetua's masculinity. I am borrowing a lot from um, L. Stephanie Cobb here, who shows us how this text, like many martyrdom texts, inverts traditional gender roles. Um, it's in her book, Dying to be Men, and it is a fantastic book, and I highly recommend it. So we can't go through the entirety of Dr. Cobb's book, but we can see what she means with a few short extracts or a few short pieces of info. So let me offer three pieces of evidence from this text. The first comes at Perpetua's trial. Her father is in attendance since she would have been considered his property, so he would have had to be in attendance. Likewise, she's facing down a judge who also has control over her autonomy and her life. And both of these men practically order her to recant her faith and to make a sacrifice to the Roman emperor. And we can talk about what persecution looked like if you're interested in that. In this situation, with two men who have control over you, a respectable Roman woman is expected to obey. But Perpetua does not. Not even when her father pleads in a very emotional scene in this text. Perpetua places her, her Christianity above her role as a daughter. So you see she's starting to sort of push back on traditional gender roles. The text also tells us that Perpetua has very recently given birth. In fact, her infant is still breastfeeding. All right, this is good, right? Because a Roman woman should preserve the integrity of the family line through giving birth to children, right? This is something Roman women were expected to do. And Perpetua is a Roman matron, you know. But when she's arrested, she gives up the role of mother. And in the end, she leaves her child with her own father. So the, the child will be raised by um, his grandfather in Perpetua's absence. Now, some of us modern readers read this in the text, and we might wish that Perpetua would just simply apostatize, right, and sacrifice for the sake of the child. But what's important to note here is that the text itself never makes that value judgment. The text itself sees Perpetua's refutation of motherhood as a testament to her faith. Again, we may disagree with that or agree with it, but that's what the text is doing. Perpetua was so devoted to Christianity that she did what no Roman woman ought to do, which is leave her family. Again, we may or may not agree with that. The most compelling 
reason to think that this text and other martyrdom texts inverts traditional gender norms is in its characterization of Perpetua in general. Roman gender roles were pretty rigid because Romans truly thought women were imperfect men. And what I mean by that is that Romans thought that women did not fully form in the womb. And so women, we are all underformed men, right? One of my students called it underbaked men. Um, so because of this, we are not as rational or as stoic or as determined as men. And those are the traditional masculine virtues of a Roman world, right? Um, good men are supposed to be rational, stoic, and determined. Women, in contrast, were weak-willed, irrational, and emotional, but not perpetua. Given the horrific ordeal she endures, she rarely behaves the way Romans would have expected a woman to behave. At her trial, she just says, I will not, when she's asked to sacrifice. She doesn't get angry, she doesn't get emotional. And even when there's some tenderness, like when she gives up her baby, she does so without the expected womanly histrionics, right? Romans would have expected her to be um, hysterical, literally hysterical. So, and most strikingly, when Perpetua is literally being mauled to death in the arena, she does not run, she does not scream out in pain. In fact, when her clothing gets disarranged, she calmly puts it back in place and waits for her death. As I said, lots of martyrdom texts depict Christian women embodying masculine Roman virtues. In fact, women are overrepresented in martyrdom texts, meaning that authors have some idea of what they're doing here. And what they're doing is that they're saying, they're signaling to Rome that Christian women were more manly than Roman men. Christianity, the Christianity that emerges in these martyrdom narratives subverts gender expectations to call out the abuses of the Roman Empire. Because how could a bunch of unmanly Roman dudes possibly stop the gospel when even Christian women have more masculine virtue than they do? Martyrdom texts offer us a different kind of history when it comes to women's leadership. It's proof that gender norms were never static, not even in Christian literature, right? And so like, forget all of Roman literature, but even in Christian literature, gender norms are fluid. More importantly, texts like the martyrdom of Perpetua and Felicity show that Christians themselves, they sort of played with these gender roles for particular the theological ends, right? So in this case, to prove that they had Christian heroes who might be um, who might be looked up to because we are talking about a period where there's persecution by Rome, right? And so Perpetua becomes this sort of heroine in early Christian texts and in early Christian sort of myth. And there would have been a lot of people who sort of looked up to her and, and the way that she has been portrayed as being very sort of masculine in the arena in the face of this horror. So we can talk more about Perpetua and Felicity. It's, it's a great text, it's one of my favorite texts. Everything is my favorite text. You're gonna hear me say this all night because I love them all. How can I choose? Um, or we can talk about other examples, but let me skip to this next case study. This case study isn't really a narrative account of a woman's deeds like martyrdom texts. Rather, these are actual words of women who belong to a group of Christians that historians call Montanists. Montanism took off in the late second century CE, after the end of what some sources call the apostolic age. Um, by this time, meaning the second century, most Christian groups had sort of accepted that the Holy Spirit no longer really moved among the adherents. And what I mean by that is that you're not seeing as much charismatic activity in the congregations, or at least in the way that the literature talks about the congregations. So the true gospel had already been passed down, right, from Jesus to Peter, and then from Peter to his successors. If you'll recall, I told you that one of Paul's major concerns in 
1 Corinthians is that worship was constantly being interrupted, right, by people who were randomly speaking in tongues, they're prophesying, or they're exhibiting some other form of charismatic gift, and it's interrupting service. Um, and so Paul, these are all gifts of the Holy Spirit, right? So this is the Holy Spirit moving through the congregation. And so Paul is writing in the 50s, and congregations had not they're still meeting in private households, and, and the rules for worship hadn't really been established. In fact, pa Paul is trying really, really hard to establish those rules. But as Christianity moves through the first and into the late second century, we see less and less emphasis on charismatic gifts like prophecy. And we see more emphasis on standardization of church offices like the deaconate, the development of liturgies, and the rise of catechetical instruction. Um, historian Karen Torgeson claims that women were systematically excluded as the church moved outside the private home. Women were no longer included in ecclesiastical hierarchies once freestanding churches were erected because, again, good Roman women were supposed to stay at home. But Montanism disrupts this easy explanation. Montanists believed that the end of the world was coming really soon they receive this information from the Holy Spirit. For them, the age of prophecy, the age of the Spirit had not closed. Christ himself, oh, I'm having trouble talking. Christ himself spoke through members of Montanist congregations, much like um, Roman oracles, if you're familiar with those. Two of these prophetesses in Montanism, um, are Maximilla and Priscilla. We don't know very much about these women, but we do have quotations of some of their prophecies preserved in the works of church fathers. You can see some of these prophecies on the slide. Um, let me draw your attention to the second one on the left attributed to Maximilla. She declares, and that's a strong word, right? She declares, after me, there will no longer be a prophet, but the end. Um, as most of you know, um, if you read something like Luke's gospel, you know that Jesus is the final prophet, is God's final prophet. And so what Maximilla is doing here is declaring herself as Jesus's final prophetess. So this is an exceptionally authoritative claim to make. She speaks the words of Christ directly to followers. On the right, take a look at the, the very last one on the bottom. This is attributed to Priscilla. We're told Priscilla makes rules for the holy minister and for the performance of rituals. This suggests that her role as prophetess is higher than the role of minister in that particular Montanist congregation. In Montanism, it's like women are calling all the shots in terms of church offices, ritual practice, and even the behavior of their fellow Christians. Montanists were very rigorous in terms of keeping high ethical standards. Because they believed the world would end soon, they were always prepared to face God's judgment. Now, Montanists were deemed a heretical group, particularly or precisely for this reason, right? Because the women who dared to prophesy in Jesus's name usurped apostolic authority and therefore could not be true emissaries of Christ. But the label heresy makes it seem like we're talking about a ragtag bunch of fringe believers somewhere out in the Judean desert. The truth is groups like Montanism were more popular than we'd assume. Even the great church father Tertullian was once a Montanist, which probably explains a lot about his views on Montanism, his later views on Montanism, and his views on women as well, and whether or not women could be in positions of authority. As far as historians can tell, the charismatic allure of, of Montanisms and Montanism and groups like it was really popular. So women like Maximilla and Priscilla should be thought of as anomalies because they were later deemed heretics. Rather, they were later deemed heretics because they posed a threat to Christians who had different views of church hierarchy 
eschatology and yeah, gender roles as well. So if we think of Perpetua's authority as coming from being more masculine than Roman men, then we can think of Max, Maximilla and Priscilla as gaining their authority by taking on the role of apostle, mouthpieces for Christ and harbingers of the end to come. This is a very different way of leading, a different kind of authority, but one that was no less effective because again, we know that these groups were popular. My final case study comes from the travel diary of a woman named Egeria who took a pilgrimage from somewhere in the Western Empire, we think it's Spain, to the Holy Land. And she did this around the 380s CE. Egeria writes her diary in the form of a really long letter detailing her travels. It's addressed to her dear ladies back home so that they could experience the Holy Land through her eyes. And she has quite a long and eventful journey. Again, a very delightful text. She visits Mount Sinai, Constantinople. She lives in Jerusalem for three years. And she takes excursions to several holy sites, including the tomb of Job, the burial place of Abraham's brother, and even the field where Christ fed the 5,000. These were all part of what we could call like a religious tourism during the fourth century and onward. And many faithful Christians would make similar pilgrimages. But what does a tourist diary have to do with women's leadership in early Christianity, you might ask? Well, if we read Egeria's diary carefully, we can see hints of women's authority and leadership peeking through her descriptions of various holy sites. For instance, Egeria writes to her fellow sisters in lots of detail because she wants them to see through her eyes as she travels. She wants them to receive the same blessings that she's receiving by traveling to these holy sites. In other words, they're a congregation of women who are finding ways to worship in community. Egeria may have been their leader, or maybe she was just the wealthiest of their group, but her letter to them becomes an authoritative text, becomes an authoritative account of these pilgrimage sites. And we know that the text is authoritative because somebody preserved it, right? This was important enough to read again and again and again. So we might also note that Egeria moves with a kind of autonomy. She has fellow travelers, but there's no indication that she's visiting all these wonderful sites, going into the chapel and then just being quiet because that's what she's supposed to do. There's no indication that she's doing that. In fact, it's the opposite. In fact, local bishops and presbyters, when she's traveling, they come to her and take her to these sacred sites that she wants to visit. And part of this could be political. Um, we can assume that Egeria was a woman of high standing. Some scholars think that she may have had connections to the emperor. But even so, what this diary tells us um, is something that uh, the scholar Sarah Parvis talks about, which is that it shows us what's possible for Christian women in late antiquity. And that's important because we're always caught up with what was impossible or what we think was impossible. And what's possible is a lot more than keeping quiet in church, clearly. Among the places Egeria visits are the shrines of St. Euphemia in Chalcedon and that of St. Thecla outside Seleucia. These shrines are also evidence of a robust veneration of saints and one that was mediated by gender. So we know, for instance, that St. Thecla was especially venerated by women. And this should be fascinating to us because the story of Thecla's martyrdom is a lot like the story of Perpetua's in that it, it thrives on inverting gender expectations. Thecla renounces her engagement to a permanent Roman man a Roman woman should not do that. She cuts her hair short, dresses like a man so that she can, um, she can minister, right? And then at one point, she even baptizes herself in a pool of rabid seals. When I tell you these texts are delightful, they're delightful. Um, and you should read it, it's great. I mean, who does it? Who baptizes themselves in a pool of rabid seals? Thecla, that's it. So the shrine of St. Thecla 
at the, at the shrine, Echeria meets the deaconess. There's that word again, right? The deaconess Marthana. And this suggests that the shrine was maybe tended to and run by women leaders. Egeria's description of these shrines opens a window onto the historical practices of Christian women that lies beyond our best known and most cited texts. Places like these with, with these vibrant legacies of women venerating women demonstrate that there's a gap between the ways that women are described in the church fathers like Tertullian and how women embodied their faith in the ancient world and how women embodied their authority in the ancient world, right? The texts don't always capture it. So the church fathers may have prescribed certain kinds of behavior for women, but women's worship and women's leadership appears far more dynamic than we might expect if we choose to limit our historical evidence in ways that center the voices and the opinions of men. So I wanna conclude this brief survey with a few words about choices, the choices we make, the choices I make as a historian, what that means for the story of Christianity that I tell to students in my classroom or to other scholars. Now, I won't presume that this is a theological task. I told you I'm terrible at theology, um, but I do think it's an ethical one because it demands an ethic. What determines which evidence we prioritize? Incidentally, every single one of the texts I shared with you tonight, except for the biblical texts, were written by women or accurately convey the words of women. This is rare. It's really rare. We think Perpetua wrote the first person sections of her diary. If that's true, it would have, it would be the only example of women's writing, Christian women's writing that we have in the first 300 years. Similarly, we know that Egeria wrote her own travel diary. And though the oracles of Maximilla and Priscilla are in texts authored by heresiologists who were men, we know from how, from their citational practices, that these quotes are likely to be accurate representations of the women's words. We don't have a lot of Christian writing from women. Even when women are featured in texts like Paul's letters or the gospels, they're written about by men. And I would argue from a male perspective. I would also argue that texts are designed to create order out of chaos. Our lives and presumably the lives of the earliest Christians cannot be fully circumcised or circumscribed by any language. So what's recorded in our historical texts can only be a fraction of what really happens on the ground. And I think we lose track of that a lot. So this is why I'm so adamant that history never yields truth, right? It can't because it, History is, by its very nature, incomplete. And so if we want to build an ethic that depends solely on history, we can't. We have to do some work. We have to acknowledge that history is incomplete. We have to fill in the blanks, and we have to be responsible for the choices that we make. Which voices from the past are we going to, or are we going to declare as authoritative, and which ones aren't? Ultimately, recovering the past is about the stories we want to tell about ourselves as much as it is about the people in the past. I personally, I, rally, I relish this messiness, this, this complicated nature of human life. I think it's beautiful and expansive. And so much of the work I do is dedicated to troubling these tidy stories that historians tell about the place of women, about Christianity's development, about what constitutes a heretic. Because I wanna hear the voices of those who are stifled or silenced. That to me, these voices, they can only add to the richness of early Christianity. I don't think they take away. Can we learn something new if we prioritize the voices of women or if we just listen to the women like, we, I, like I chose to do for this presentation? I tell my students all the time that the choices that we make, the evidence that we choose to prioritize really matters because the biblical text can be used to justify almost anything you want it to justify. 
So you have to bear responsibility for how you use that text and the choices you make. What we choose to read, who to ignore, what to include, and even where we draw the line between past and present is a choice, and those choices, I think, are never neutral. That's about as theological as I get. These choices are always conditioned by the things that we want, and I don't necessarily think that this is a bad thing, right, that we make these choices. It's a human thing. Of course we make choices. However, I think when we appeal to the past as though it's self-evident, and in no need of interpretation or not subject to choices we make, we'll fall into a dangerous trap because we limit then how we see our historical subjects. And maybe that's fine for somebody. There's a reason not every scholar writes error on every text, right? Um, but I'd argue that invoking the past as if the pure sort of unadulterated Christianity of the first century just existed, was just out there, and that we should take this as truth, and that we should take somebody's interpretation of it as truth, well, I think we're in trouble then. Because assuming the past is self-evident and that we're not responsible for how we talk about it only obscures any kind of truth that I think we'd want to find. So rather than revelation of new possibilities, new histories, new ways to think about the past and how we use it, we close those possibilities off. And so the moral of my talk, if I have one, is simply this, that we should always ask ourselves which histories matter, most for the future that we want to build. And we should always think about what ethics govern our choices for the histories we choose to tell. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Patel. That was extraordinary. Um, I'm just uh, very interested in, in some of your ideas. One of the things I noticed is when you talked about the Danvers statement, the, nine, the November 1988 statement, John Paul II actually produced Boulieris Dignitatum on August 15th, 1988, which incorporates the same complementarity that uh, for the first time in the Catholic Church, somebody says women are equal, but then there's the big but but then they have these roles and they're complementary. So, so that's interesting how those two uh, traditions sort of, maybe they were in cahoots in the back room or something, who knows? I mean, this uh, is they always sort of ex escape, right? Like we yeah. can't keep these things contained. I always thought it was ironic that, that complementarianism is what they chose, right? Because yeah. it gives the illusion of egalitarianism. It, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I always say it's a great marketing. Okay, so we're <laughs> going to open this up for questions. So if you, we're only going to be able to take a few because we're getting really close. So if you have a burning question, we're glad to take it. Just uh, raise your little uh, reaction button uh, and let me know what you want to say. And I see we have... Andrea, you have a question. Um, are you including the desert mothers in uh, any of your research of the first 300 years? I'm not. Um, those texts are actually a little later than my period. Even Nigeria's diary is a little later than my period. I usually work from uh, 33 to three, 300, um, but they would be a fantastic source for uh, different kinds of women's leadership. And I particularly, you know, in monastic settings, what you're getting is a leadership structure that is designed to explicitly compete with the leadership structures that we see in the cities, right? So this would be an interesting place to, to see how women are leading themselves. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Andrea. Barbara, you have a question? Yes, is it possible that these women came from pagan religions, that they were leaders in pagan religions and converted? And so then uh, if they had titles coming over from a pagan religion, they would carry it into the Christian religion. I mean, the Temple of Ephesus stayed open until the 300s, I think. Um, so I was just wondering, I've never read any studies where they've talked about because it seems to me Acts is full of women that were already leaders. So how did they already get to be leaders if they, unless they were coming from already 
other religions where they were leaders. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with that, right? Um, so, you know, the, the first Christian converts are either going to be Jewish or pagan, Roman pagan, right? And so, um, you know, within, within Roman society, which includes Judaism, Christianity, and, and Roman paganism, you're going to have women who are leaders, usually because they have a lot of money and they're married to somebody who is um, you know, sort of upstanding, or they serve as priestesses in, in um, particular Roman religions. I am not sure how the title of something like priestess would translate from, let's say, the cult of Isis to a new Christian congregation, right? Um, especially because that early, the Christian congregations are still trying to figure out what their leadership structures look like mm -hmm. and so it seems that the women were leadership leaders within these early christian households because women ran roman households right they're the ones who had control of the finances they're the ones who made the the, the home run and so it's just a natural place for them to be leaders in these household churches because they would have been leaders in the household right and so, yeah, I agree with you. I think that, you know, there is some carryover and you know, we don't put groups and people into silos, right? Um, all of our experiences and all the things we do, we carry from one place to another. And that's true of the ancient world as well. Thanks, Barbara, good question. Beth, you have a question. Yes, thank you. Uh, I appreciated your presentation and you. perhaps you already addressed it with the first question, but um, would the Gospel of Mary Magdalene fall within the time frame of your research as well? Yeah, I love that text. Second century? Yeah, um, so we think that Gospel is around second century, right? Um, late second, early third, maybe mid third. Um, so yeah, it does fall within, um, it does fall within my period. And you're asking about that, correct me, correct me if I'm wrong. You're asking about that text because in that text, Mary, is set above the disciples. She's the one who understands Jesus, right? Everybody else kind of sort of doesn't, right? She's Jesus's favorite disciple. And you could see the rest of them getting jealous of her, right? That you can say that in the, if you're jealous of her, Peter, because Jesus loves her the most. Um, so, you know, in this text, and this is sometimes called a Gnostic text, right? It's, it's classed as a Gnostic text. And I think, that that sort of labeling is a problem sometimes because it suggests that people who are not Gnostic Christians wouldn't have read that text or wouldn't have been influenced by that text. Okay, I'm not a Muslim, but I read the Quran and I find it very life giving. And so, you know, to suggest that people just move in these narrow silos, that's not how people work and that's not how history works. And so I think that you know, something like the Gospel of Mary Magdalene likely was more popular than just, oh, it's just the heretic Gnostics that read that, right? Like, we know that these groups are reading one another's texts. I love that text, it's so good. Thank you. Thanks, Beth. So I think the last question we'll take is Evangeline, my friend from India. Oh, Evangeline. Thank Oh, there you go. Okay, good, good. good thank good. you, Deborah, and thank you, Shirley, for the presentation. Truly appreciated the way in which you highlighted the importance of history as a very critical source of our theology, of our thinking, of just kind of constructing that body of knowledge. And uh, as you pointed out very clearly in your presentation, that the need for the dominant perspective and the trend to constantly be threatened by this voice or voices that transgress the boundaries, the expectations of that time, when it is so clearly evident in the Bible, I raise similar kind of this hermeneutics of suspicion question yes. when history today is there's an attempt to dismiss history because it may kind of uh, unsettle the kids who go to school and you know everything about that uh, CRT. So I'm wondering how we can kind of uh, 
keep that emphasis on history as a very important source of our knowledge, our constructing knowledge and our world and worldview. How do we keep up that importance? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I would say that we have no identity if we don't know our history, right? We don't know who we are if we don't understand the genealogy from which we come. That being said, I don't think that it's um, necessarily to our advantage or even ethical to take someone else's read of that history as capital T truth. And so this is why I'm always telling my students to interrogate everything like people are always trying to insult your intelligence. It's a hermeneutic of suspicion, like you said, right? Even what I say in class, I want them to, to be critical of that, to interrogate that, to say, mm, I don't know, Dr. Patel, this, this evidence here is a little shaky to me, right? Because when we get into the habit of interrogating the voices of the people in power, I think we can leverage the histories that have been suppressed to do really wonderful liberating work. And so that's my goal, like both in my scholarship and also when I'm talking to the public or in the classroom, right, is how do we use history responsibly? Um, I don't think we can just dispense with it. We can't just be like, oh, everything changes. We don't need to talk about the past because without a past, we have no present or future. But I also think that the responsibility needs to be on us. We have to take on that, that responsibility to think about ethical ways to talk about the past and how what that means for the futures we want to build. Thank you so much for your question. Those are my favorite questions to answer. What do we do with history? Deb, this is Russ, you're muted. All right, uh, your, your references to Ash Dodd, this, the sort of uncovering, can you give us just a quick sense of what we're learning because of the sites like that? What's new in, in those discoveries? Yeah, um, so I'm not an archeologist, so I, I don't, um, I'm not in the field, which I get made fun of a lot, right? Like I wear heels, we can't be in the field. Um, but one of the things that these, these material sites like Ashdod and other places, and, and especially things like cemeteries, right, that one of the things that these sites are doing for us is it's troubling this dominant narrative, which is, you know, women had to stay in the house, men were in leadership positions because the church moved outside of the private house. That's a really nice narrative, right? Like that's a really tidy narrative. But we know from places like Ashdod, that's just not the case. That's a freestanding basilica and they have women leaders. Um, you know, and, and it's happening around the same time. Like there, there are women leaders at Ashdod around the same time that Augustine is telling women that they're all Eves, right? <laughs> and that they don't have anything useful to say. And so what it does is it helps us, um, like Evangeline was saying, right? It helps us develop this hermeneutic of suspicion when we read somebody like Augustine and we say, okay, now we have to choose, right? We have these two pieces of evidence. Does this literary text match up with the lived realities of Christians in the ancient world? And I, you know, I may be biased on this because I work on literary texts. I just don't think they do. I think people are a lot messier than the literary texts um, would make them. I think that's a beautiful, wonderful thing, um, but it, what it does is it hides a lot of the work that women did in terms of developing Christianity. And so we have to look past the literary text. And I think that's what Ashton does for us. And that's why it's so important. Thank you. Oh my gosh. I am just feeling so grateful right now, just for you and your work and, oh, and thank your, you. the, it's your enlightenment. Been a pleasure. Yeah, so thank you for this amazing presentation. And I'm well, going to thank you guys. I'm so, you know, I know I went a little long. Thank you all. For no, no, it's great. It was me. wonderful. Every minute was beautiful. I'm going to turn this back over to Russ so he can uh, do our final prayers and so forth.